This episode of Curiosity's Sake is going to be the Easter special, and it's going to be a rather special Easter special, as I'm going to be doing a movie and film bundle of... The Pilgrim's Progress from this world to that which is to come, delivered under the similitude of a dream wherein discovered the manner of his letting out his dangerous journey and fate arrival at the defiled country. What kind of title is that? Well, its more commonly known title is The Pilgrim's Progress, or The Pilgrim's Progress from this world to that which is to come. I guess old books like old movies just need to put half of their word count in the title. The Pilgrim's Progress is brought to us by Scott Cawthon, who you might know as the guy who made the Five Nights at Freddy's video games. He actually made this about a decade earlier, and actually wanted to make it into both a movie and a video game adaptation. This story has had around 27 adaptations. Oh, wait, no, 26, as Peter's progress wasn't anything to do with the Pilgrim's progress, and therefore it doesn't count. The story is a religious allegory book written in the late 1670s and is more or less a representative tale of the journey that a Christian takes over the course of their life. It's actually quite an influential book, bringing to life some of the places described in the Bible and later influencing future stories with concepts like an early depiction of Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. And apparently this video is going to come out around the same time as a new animated adaptation. What a coinky dink! But anyway, I'll be focusing on this mid 2000s adaptation by Scott Cawthon, which will prove hopefully entertaining and fun regardless. So I had to do a bit of thinking as to whether or not I wanted to do the video game or the movie first, and after some thought, I realised that it would be easier to talk about the movie first so that you're familiar with the story before I go on to talk about the video game. So, let's play... Watch The Pilgrim's Progress. My name is Christian. Hi, Christian. So the movie begins showing off its most impressive visuals, with Christian crossing over the river of death at the end of the movie. Now you might ask, what significance does this scene have that makes it important to show it before the start of the movie? None. Already you can kind of tell that this isn't exactly Pixar levels of 3D animation. But it was made by a small team on a tiny ass budget, and unlike Joshua and the Promised Land, there aren't actually that many mistakes in this movie. In fact, I haven't found any thus far. While this isn't the best looking film, it's clear to me that they did the best with what they could, and in the end, isn't that all that matters? No, it's not. Yeah, well, fuck you. Anyway, Christian does a smart and accidentally sinks himself into the river of death and drowns. Oh, that was a brief movie. I give this short movie the low score of an 8 out of 10. Oh, I'm just being an ass. I wouldn't deprive you of this award-winning acting right here. No, it's too deep. I've been abandoned. My sin was too great. You have been made whole. Look there, he waits for you. He made a promise to you, Christian. Yes. Yes, I see him again. I see the other side. I see it. I... Yeah, it's quite clear that they just used whoever was nearby, regardless as to whether or not they should be doing voice work. But hey, they try, and at least it's not Dingo Pictures level bad where they're doing flubs. Apparently the only two actors in this are Scott and a relative of his. I'm not sure who she is, but she voices the female characters. And so, Christian resides himself to death and drowns, and everything in this movie is his dying last thoughts. Actually, no, he was just having the quickest crisis of faith the world has ever seen, and after a few words, they talk him out of it. And then he dies! You see, there might have been a point to this if we didn't see God's hand there, but unfortunately we now know that he survives the river of death. Or doesn't die and go to hell, his soul is saved, or whatever surviving the river of death means. So, it's pointless. 
Seriously, if they cut it off as he went under the water, we would have at least had the suspense of, will he make it? But at this point, we just need to see a whole movie to find out what happens after he makes it. This isn't how you do an opening thing. So the movie goes on to show us some more shit that we're going to see later in the movie, so we can credit the two people who worked on this thing and admire the artwork. Or the filters, whatever. The movie begins with Christian explaining his reason for trying to drown himself in the river of death. Oh, and he also tells us that he's a resident of the City of Destruction. What, does Mayroon's Dagon live there or something? You'd think that the name alone would be a warning sign. I mean, it's called the City of Destruction, right? Or did they just name it that at the start, like people do when they start playing SimCity and know that the town's gonna end up fucked in the end? Christian has read his Bible and has become aware of what an ass he is, and how many sins he has committed. He carries his sins on his back as a literal burden weighed down by them. And here we encounter three of my problems with this story. The story is meant to be allegory. Hell, it comes up as an example of allegory when you look up the word's definition online. And yet, the way the allegory is presented is so blunt. Everything is just a dictionary definition in this universe. Like, the main character's name is Christian, and he carries a bundle that has all his sins, and it's his burden, and he lives in a doomed city. It's meant to be allegory, but I feel like the allegory is missing the most important part about allegory, which is the interpretation. A good allegory story, like Animal Farm, doesn't just call all the pigs Communist A and Communist B. No, because it wants you to actually think. A good allegory like Animal Farm could apply to more situations than it does originally. Initially it was about the Russian Revolution, but we could apply it to any revolution. The idea that once we replace one evil and replace it with something else, that could be an equally bad or even worse evil. But The Pilgrim's Progress is literally one story. It's a basic hero's journey story that can have no other meaning because all the characters are just dictionary definitions. I had tried desperately to convince my wife of the destruction that was coming, but she enjoyed the world too much and didn't want to face the possibility of losing it. She called me a fool and thought of it no more. Oh, so you mean your wife didn't believe you when you started wearing a big-ass bag on your back like a bad outward player and started ranting about the end of the world? What a shock. It's quite interesting that they omit Christian's baby from the book, because in the book he actually abandons his wife and his child, whereas in the movie it's just his wife. Yeah, okay, his journey is real and it does amount to something real, but... The doubt of his neighbours, wife, and everybody else around him is pretty legitimate, considering that he just woke up one morning, started ranting about sin, and then tries to leave the city to go on some mad pilgrimage. I mean, he does this overnight. This is gonna look more like mental illness than an epiphany to most people. Even people who know this is real are not going to buy into it immediately because he sounds like a raving madman. In fact, these dictionary definitions are depicted as the bad guys for going after him and trying to deter him from his quest. But he can't be convinced, so one of them goes home. The other stays with him for a bit, but then it gets too dangerous, so he clears off as well. So if your neighbour starts ranting about the end of the world and tries to abandon his wife and kid to just run off into the wilderness to find heaven, surely you're not a bad person for being a bit concerned? If you give a remote shit about them, which, given how close tight-knit this community is, I imagine that they would, they're like one big family, like a village, then they're not really bad people for trying to stop him from running off and getting himself killed, especially when it's at the expense of his wife and kid. But no, they're the villains. So then Christian meets- Whoa, fuck! Oh god, a teleporting dwarf appears before him. That's not fucking terrifying at all. Um, excuse me, but what troubles you so much, young man? Well, you see, I've been reading this good book, and I know that I'm doomed to die for the sins that I carry, and I'm afraid that when I die, 
my burden will be so heavy that it will sink me lower than the grave. And so you would like to escape from this city, and also free yourself from that burden? Yes, but I can't see how that's possible. I am a wretched person. How can sin be undone? What hope is there for me? Well, do you see that light shining over the field? Go towards that light, and you will see a small gate. When you get there, knock, and you will be told what to do. So Christian sets off running, only to be stopped by these two jackasses. As I said before, these two are the subtly named Obstinance and Pliable, and they're two very helpful people who will be with him to the end. All the way through this, my only thought is, if I was kind wise man, could I trick people into like giving me their money or something? Oh, hello there young boy. My name is Kind Wise Man, and I've come to protect your wallet. Wow! My name's Gullible Idiot, and I believe you a lot! Here, take my wallet! Oh, <laughs> well, actually, my real name is Lying Sack of Shit, so I'm just going to take this and be on my way. Oh. Well. Maybe he'll create jobs with that money. However, Christian is not dissuaded by them and brings Pliable along for the journey as his starting companion. One thing that I find kind of funny here is that this story actually encourages people to abandon their friends and family. Earthly possessions I get, but why do Christians hate you loving your friends and family so much and actually sticking by them? and leave our friends and comforts behind? What could you possibly be searching for that would be worth leaving the whole world behind you? All of this is worthless compared with just a small piece of what I hope to enjoy. All of this is worthless compared with just a small piece of what I hope to enjoy. My son is 15 years old and he's worth nothing. Wow, so your wife, friends and family as well as your children are worthless. I'm sorry, these are supposed to be the good guys? I am aware that a lot of my problems with this are the actual source material and not this adaptation. Despite how faithful this adaptation is, it's only saying what's on the page and I can't really fault it for that. Though Scotty Boy did think that this was worth adapting into an animated movie, so you're damn right I'm gonna judge the hell out of what these characters are saying. There's no suffering, no cruelty, none of the horrible things of this world. We will meet God and live in a place that he has prepared for us. Why would God want us to live with him? Are you sure we will be welcome? We are his creation, his children. He wants nothing more than for us to seek him. Won't he know about the bad things I've done? I've done evil things as well, but God must have a way to cleanse me, or there wouldn't be such a desire in my heart to find him. Well, you think that your children are worthless, Christian, so I won't put too much bank on that. It is written by God, and God cannot lie. Well, God can't lie, apart from that time he told Abraham he'd be killing his son Isaac. Or can God only lie when he's playing hilarious pranks where he tricks parents into thinking they gotta kill their kids? I hope we will be there soon. Whoa! <laughs> 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 Is this your promised land? I don't see any creepy, untextured lions about. What the fuck, Christian Clemens? What kind of promised land is this? Seriously, he thought they would have found the promised land a few feet over yonder from where they started? I know that he doesn't exactly know where it is, but surely he doesn't think it's within a day's walking distance of the town, or else you'd be able to see it from the city. Or the hills. Here's a fun bit of speculation for you. Did you know that John Bunyan lived in Bedford, England, and that the journey was actually the journey from Bedford to London? So, the swamp of despair that they are currently stuck in is actually a nice little English village called, uh... Oh, hold on a second, let me just check on my computer. Sewer B. Suet B. It looks a lot nicer in real life. 
If this is what happens at the very start of our journey, who knows what dangers we will face later. Oh yeah, because we all know that the best part of a journey is the start, and you never run into problems at the start of the journey. It's usually about halfway through. Idiot. I'm going home. Oh, well, let's face it, pilgrimages are ruined. Oh well, Christian is forced to go on without Pliable's help, and he's stuck in a gross-looking boggy swamp, jankily tripping over as he goes. He is then saved by Helpful, but it's actually lying sack of shit in disguise. Oh, I'm just kidding. But this is Helpful, here to save the day with his southern state accent. Even though he lives in Bedford. Bedford, England. So after telling him that the swamp sucks because he sucks, because clever allegory, Christian moves on to the city of morality. Hey, 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 whoa, whoa there. Where are you going with that large burden on your back? I'm going to the small gate. Evangelist told me how to get there. Evangelist? Ha! I've heard this story a thousand times. If you want to free yourself from that burden, there's a much easier way. There is? Of course. My name is Mr. Worldly Wiseman. <laughs> okay, that's his name. I feel really bad for him when he has to write checks. So he goes on to say that the way that you really get into heaven is by being a good person and following Moses' Ten Commandments and be a moral person. But true Christians aren't moral. What a stupid notion. A character called Moses actually did appear in this story, funnily enough, and is possibly this guy in the animation, and is seen as an antagonist alongside Adam the First, who is apparently the first Adam ever made. Well, considering that they run with a guy called Lord Hate God, I wouldn't really be surprised if that was the case. In the book, Worldly Wise Man actually tricked pilgrims into following the laws of man rather than the laws of God. Rather than it being about morality, it was more about making him surrender to man's authority rather than God's until he rejected Jesus and God entirely. I honestly don't think that's explained very well in this adaptation. He's more or less a trickster who acts as if he's found a loophole into heaven, rather than the embodiment of the flaw of man's law. Yeah, well, either way, I think it's stupid, but at least I finally understand why Christians often ask if you don't believe in a god, then how come you haven't gone on a killing, raping spree? Because hellfire is literally the only thing stopping these people from doing it, apparently. Seriously, that's the message that this movie gives me. Not to mention that in Romans 13, 1-2, it says, Obey the government, for God is the one who put it there. There is no government anywhere that God has not placed in power, so those who refuse to obey the law of the land are refusing to obey God, and punishment will follow. So, yeah, you kind of overlooked that one, didn't you, Mr. Bunyan? Sure you have heard of the Law of Moses. You know, the Ten Commandments. We'll go right up this hill, to that little town you see up there. That is the town of morality. Go there, and you can learn to become a good person. Become a good person, and you will earn your reward. Your reward of speaking normally. So, Christian walks up the approach and is immediately ambushed by this creepy dwarf motherfucker who appears out of nowhere and makes him jump like it would anyone. The oh, fuck! Oh, uh... Anyway, Evangelist explains that an evil heart can do no good, and therefore trying to be good is pointless. So, um, Hitler couldn't save a family from a burning building then? I mean, he could in theory do that, and it would be a good deed, so an evil heart can do good. What the fuck are you saying, you crazy-ass dwarf? 
Oh wait, no, I forgot. The family and friends in that building are worthless. Hitler would only be a good person if he marched past them and went on his bullshit journey of madness because fuck, fuck, fuckity fuck. Honestly, the further into this story we get, the worse I feel for people who actually see the world this way. Well, Christian then fucks off and leaves the town of morality behind, eventually finding this inviting looking castle on the horizon. This is Beelzebub's castle, which is actually a whole level in the game. But in the movie, it's just briefly glossed over. I guess in this universe, Beelzebub wasn't paying much attention until it was too late and only just suddenly realized, oh shit, I should be firing arrows at this little prick. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Goodwill, and you are? I am just a sinner from the City of Destruction. I am trying to flee from the wrath that is coming and reach the Celestial City, the City of God. I am told that it is through this narrow gate. Will you please let me through? With all my heart. Whoa! Why did you pull me? I was going to eat you, but then decided not to. Wait, are you... pliable? You look just like him. No, I killed him ate him, and wore his face. <coughs> oh. good -o. My heart. Whoa! Why did you pull me? That is the castle of Beelzebub on that hill. He shoots arrows of fire at all that approach this gate, hoping that they will die before they reach it. Ah yes, here they come now! We must run! Nonsense, we are perfectly safe. We are on the other side of the gate. I'm sorry. Oh, man, I'm perfectly safe. <laughs> this is the path you must now follow. It is as straight as a ruler. Road straight as my dick. There are many other paths that branch away from it. Paths that are very wide. Stay true to this straight, narrow path to the place of deliverance. Then you can finally be free of that burden once and for all. So Christian camps in the wilderness and... <laughs> Oh no, a punga of a lobster flew over the moon. Scary. Hmm, where is that Christian? He should be here by now. I hope he didn't get sidetracked. Oh, hello. Who the fuck are you and what do you have to do with anything? <laughs> I'm just being an ass. This is the interpreter. He tells Christian how to go about his insane journey. I am the interpreter. I keep it a bit dark in here. That's so you can pay attention to the things that you are supposed to pay attention to. Like your broken nose. Oh. <laughs> ah, here we go. I've put together a little presentation for you. You know, to make things easier. Uh, did you want popcorn? Uh, no, no thank you. Suit yourself. Roll the film! So let me get this straight, they have popcorn and film projectors in this universe, but they still wear sackcloth. I guess this is the universe after the Fallout universe where technology only advanced in areas that it felt like advancing and stupidity ran rampant throughout the world. Do you know who this is? Christ? That's right, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is the only person that God ever gave authority to to be our guide in all difficult places. Remember this well, for others have made false claims to speak for God, but their ways always lead to death. Not like our way that leads to the fucking river of death. A man in a very dusty room. It looks like he is going to try to sweep it. Oh my, look at that dust fly. 
He will never clean it up like that. But wait a second. Let's see what happens when some water is sprinkled on the floor. Oh, look at that. The dust is clean. Objection! If you throw water on the floor, then how are the walls clean? This is just your typical BS propaganda. And then we move on to the patience and greed part, which is also flawed as the idea is that greed gets all the good stuff in this life and patience gets her stuff in the hereafter. Because stuff we get immediately is never as good as stuff we get after years of waiting. That's why winning the lottery sucks. Actually, no, that's a better analogy because lottery winners tend not to appreciate the value of money and will likely blow it all on stupid shit and end up in debt, whereas a person who saved for it won't. Of course, it's a rather broad thing as a sensible man with a lot of money is not going to be a stupid with said money as someone who's stupid regardless of how they get it. What if the thing that you want is only going to exist in this life? Like, what if you want a specific woman really badly who probably might not get to heaven and you would give up pretty much everything to be with her? Like... That's not a viable option to these people. Some things are only available for a short amount of time, and you may regret it for eternity if you don't take them up. But of course that's just greed speaking, not fucking reality. We then find out that we're actually watching a 5D movie where you can talk to the characters on the screen. Well, why don't you ask him? Sir, what has happened to you? I once thought I was righteous, and I was happy with such thoughts. But I gave in to my lusts and desires. I wanted worldly things and turned my back to God. Now I have difficulty taking pleasure in His word. Well, I'm afraid that masturbating to Bible verses is just going to get old after a while, buddy. That's just how it goes. Now just fuck off so I can change the channel and tell Peter Griffin that he's a pedophile prick and tell him to eat shit and die. I am in an iron cage of despair. No, you're not. You're in a very big but poorly lit room, you lying sack of shit. Lord, help me to watch and be sober so that this man's misery never falls on me. I do love how Christian's biggest concern here is that this poor asshole's fate doesn't befall him. He doesn't ask if he can help him or anything, it's just, wow, sucks to be him, glad I'm not that guy. Honestly, one of the things that I really dislike about this story is just how selfish everyone is. It's all about my personal connection to God and not anything else. And if you dare stop to give a shit about anyone or anything else, you're punished forever. How am I supposed to relate to this? You are ready to continue your journey, young Christian. Oh, I was ready five minutes ago when he got there. Anyway, he fucks off and leaves the interpreter to his stone box inside his big bee syrup box. Oh, that's the sky box. It's so... ugh. Yeah, that totally looks like it's there. Anyway, it's here that Christian kneels before the cross and accepts Jesus into his heart. What does this mean? No, wait, my mistake. This is where he learns what Jesus means. My bad. So it's here that he meets Jesus and has to ask him, you know, to confirm that it is indeed him and if he'll die and take his burden on for him. Are you here to die for the sins of the world? You see, I have this, my burden, my sin, I, I cannot rid myself of it. Will you be kind enough to bear it for me and die for me as well?
Aww, you're the best, Jesus. Well, you know, except for that time that you left me to die. Christian is then freed from his burden and meets these creepy fuckers who slide over to him on their wheels. Ralph, Jesus did not have wheels. And they inform him that he is now a new creation before they devour his face and his soul. So then he finds these idiots chained up to a pole and decides to annoy them because he's an ass. Gee, I wonder what these three represent. From what I can tell, these three weren't characters in the book, or at least weren't named characters in the book. Why do you let yourselves sleep like this? Don't you see that you're in shackles? There's a great beast that walks this road. If he finds you like this, you will surely be eaten. Uh, I see no danger. Let me help you. Let me help you. Deliver your lines more convincingly. Uh, you go first, hypocrisy. No, no, formality. I insist. You go first. Are you sure this spot is the easiest way over? Positive. One, two, three. <coughs> so these are two characters from the book who like to cut corners. So of course they are going to be... But you will be considered no better than thieves for entering this way. Oh, like you have room to talk, deadbeat dad. At least it, all they did was hop a gate. Hmm, the hill of difficulty. Well, this won't do. It's much too steep. So then they spot the hill of difficulty, which is apparently a hill in Amphil, England. And it looks like this in real life. Really? That's what these twits are umming and erring about? I've done hills three times bigger than that. So these idiots decide to take the roads of danger and destruction because those sound a lot safer than the Hill of Difficulty. Really? The beat you over the head symbolism in this crap really starts to get under my skin when people are so stupid that they see a road literally marked death and decide to walk it anyway. And yeah, I get, that's the point. But I don't care, that doesn't make it good. And these two jackasses decide to go down their chosen roads and die. At least this adaptation shows them getting what they deserve. You know, for not wanting to go up a massive steep hill that they could die on. Meanwhile, Christian swims up the hillside majestically and makes it to the top. And it's truly breathtaking or something. Then finds this house and we realise something about Christian. He's smart enough to know to leave an area when there are lions about. I hear a mountain lion. A mountain lion? In my basement? But in this universe, that makes him an idiot and he gets bullied by this Tombury guy. Stay in the middle of the path and you will not be harmed. Thank you. What is this place? This is a place built by God for pilgrims such as yourself. It is a house for God's family. A family that you are now a part of. They are here to give you support and to give you strength. Please come inside. Can I help you? Um, hello. I was told that I might be able to stay here for the night as this place was built for the relief of pilgrims such as myself. As someone who lives here, you probably didn't know that this was this building's purpose. Nope! Ah, shit. My name is Discretion. Oh, I'm amazed that John Bunyan even knew where that was. So he sits down with Discretion, Prudence, Piety and Charity. Sound like Christian Porsar names to me. But anyway, he explains why he left the City of Destruction behind. The characters vaguely look like animated dolls, but it's during this scene that the freakiness of that really jumps out at you. Like a Five Nights at Freddy's scare, as these women do not move unless they're given a speaking role. Like some weird mannequin or sculpture or robot. It's just fucking weird. And I am ashamed of that. I fear that I will never be completely free of worldly thoughts. I am just glad that those thoughts are now my shame and not my joy. 
My joy now is looking ahead to the better country that has been promised to me. Did you not have a wife? Why did you not bring her with you? I did have a wife, but she could not let go of the world that she knew. She thought that her things brought her happiness. Did you try your best to persuade her to go with you? Did you perhaps give her a reason to think poorly of your cause? No, I was very careful to be loving in everything I said. In fact, what frustrated her was how careful I was not to sin, and how I felt that we should love others, even our enemies. Since when has loving others been part of anyone's itinerary here? You jackasses have only shown interest in loving yourselves. Fuck. The next morning, Christian awakes with one eye open before opening both of them, because that's normal. And then he sees the delightful mountains. Anyway, fuck that noise as Fuckface McTomberry gives him the Armor of God. The Armor of God? Why does that sound familiar? As Bible Man. Does that mean that he's the original Bible Man? Holy shit! The Bible Man's coming, so you better stick around. A brand new episode is coming to your town. A whole lot of fun with the greatest book of all. Yeah, the Bible Man's coming, and it's gonna be a ball. Go get everyone you know. Cause it's just about time for the Bible Man Show. It's the Bible, it's the Bible, it's the Bible Man Show. You are from the City of Destruction, are you not? At this point, he finally takes on Apollyon, the everything who lords over Christian's homeland in the Valley of Humiliation. Unfortunately, you're going to have to wait for the game to see the Dominatrixes in the Valley of Domination. I'm sorry. I am the Lord and King of the land that you come from. And you are one of my servants. My name is Apollyon. This guy is apparently the Angel Abaddon, who is the King of Locusts in the New Testament, and the Angel of the Abyss in the Old Testament. And now he's basically the Bible's equivalent of Merun's Dagon. Hmm, guess that means I gotta take that Elder Scrolls reference back now. Well I won't suck on that! In most religions, he's depicted as a demon of despair of some kind, but the Methodists still think he's cool. But anyway, fuck all that, because this shit turns into Christian Dark Souls, as Christian Clemens throws himself into the fray and fights the demon head on. It is true that I was born into slavery to you, but I grew up. I want to mend myself. Wait, hold the shit, he was born into slavery? What kind of slaver lets you sit around all day doing nothing? And then lets you leave whenever you feel like it? Oh, careful guys at Paradise Falls, you should take notes. You leave. Come back with me, and I will grant you as many riches as the world can afford. Oh no, what a horrible master! Offering you riches to come back and be a slave. Oh come now, people do it all the time. Oh well, if people do it all the time, then I guess I've got to do it. Haha, ha. gets them every time. Uh, I'm an enemy to this god. I hate him and his people. Oh, too subtle. Can't take it. Oh. Be careful what you do, Apollyon. This is the Lord's Highway. Don't you know that the followers of your god meet horrible ends, usually by my hands? It is the path that I choose. And no matter what happens to me now, I will be alive in God's kingdom long after you and this world have been forgotten. Well then, concerning what happens to you now, let's make the most of it, shall we?
have to admit, I did quite like the fight scenes in this. I thought that they were not brilliantly animated, but it's quite clear that there was a lot of effort put into making it as good as possible. And it actually kind of reminded me of several video games I've played over the years. Though it is kind of stupid how he loses this giant monster and has no idea where he is. I mean, he'd be able to hear or smell him or something that close. Oh man, you've gone and done pissed Christian off. No, wait, no, no, he's just a wimp who's gotten the wind kicked out of him. From being hit against a wall, what a pussy. Cut off my arm, I will grow another. Chop off my tail, I will grow three more. You are outmatched, and you will fall. Rejoice not against me, O oh mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. <laughs> then take your best shot at me. After that, I will show you how wrong you are. You will never rise again, not in this world or the world to come. <laughs> Fatality. So, if he could be killed that easily, why did he let him take a shot? Really, I know it would be like a massive stroke of luck for someone to think to shoot the skeleton on top, but why would you risk it unless you were a fucking idiot? Oh wait, everyone's a fucking idiot in this story. Carry on. Thank you. O oh Lord, for delivering me. Well, that's the first part over. Join me next time in part two, where Christian goes to a fair and some other stuff happens. Bible man's coming, so you better stick around. A brand new episode is coming to your town. A whole lot of fun with the greatest book of all. Yeah, the Bible man's coming, and it's gonna be a ball. Go get everyone you know. Cause it's just about time for the Bible man show. It's the Bible, it's the Bible, it's the Bible man show. We're learning how to live, and we're learning how to grow. It's storytelling, picture painting, grooving, don't you know? Everybody get ready for the Bible man show. Well, I know at least one of you wanted to know what the hell this thing does, so uh, I put some batteries in it. Uh, had to go through all of those in order to like figure out which ones were right, but I eventually did it. So, here we go. I'm sure that was worth the suspense. Could have done that like two episodes ago. Dickhead. <laughs>